to the Insomniac Show with Nicolette and Brian. We'll get real deep with you. Educating, inspiring, and solving problems with some of the most inspirational humans on the planet. Buckle up and hey, come on the journey. Mm-hmm. I'm excited. All right, guys. I'm Nicolette, and today Brian and I are here with Jake Dardy. He is the CEO of Deary Dari, but he's going to tell us how to actually pronounce that. And uh, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, his his journey into the travel industry, which then took a little bit of a pivot during the pandemic. And now we're going to talk about food. So we have a fun a fun chat today. And uh, I love food. So there you go. <laughs> Jake, thank you so much for joining us. Well, guys, thank you so much for having me here on Insomnia Cat. I am super excited to be here. This is great. <laughs> All right, so tell us how to actually pronounce the name, please. Yes. Now that I've yeah, no problem. It. So the, the name of the platform, it's called Deary Dari, D-E-R-I-D-A-R-I. Now the name, it's got a ton of history. It, uh, it originally dates back to the 15th century. Uh, there was a market that occurred here in the Alps in a small village called Mittenwald. And the Italians would come north to this market. And when they wanted to pay using coin, they would say, let's pay with a diddy diddy, mm-hmm. um, which is simply mean like a coin or a cash payment. Eventually, though, you have the 1600s, you have this horrible war, the 30 years war, where like three fourths of the population was killed and everybody died of plague, disease, starvation. It was just God awful, to say the least. And nobody had any coins. Nobody had any way to pay with cash. And so what they oftentimes would do is make what's called a a diri dari, which around here meant like a trade of services. And then after everybody started coming back, it simply can also still means a little bit, still today means cash payment or a trade of services. It can go either way. And we took that name because the three founders of our platform, all at one time or another, worked here in Garmisch Partenkirchen, Germany, where I still live today. We all worked here for the American military. And around the corner from where we lived on an American military base was a bar. And you'll never guess what it was called. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might. I think I can. <laughs> So that's where we got the name from. It was something that was common to us. It was whimsical. And it also meant an exchange of services, which is what our platform is. It's where chefs come together. They create content in the form of recipes, meal plans, kitchen skills, and they teach it to people around the world. And we can bring families and we can bring friends together into a virtual kitchen with a chef and they can cook a meal together and learn. It's a lot of fun. Okay, I have, I have a question. Why was the bar named that? What were they trading? <laughs> <laughs> They're trading alcohol tra- for fun. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Brian, many a night I'd walk in and be like, I can do dishes. I can really do dishes. <laughs> I'll trade you. I can't pay for my beer, but I will, tra- I will do the dishes. <laughs> you, got <laughs> you, go. <laughs> you got it. It never worked for me. It never worked. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jake, before, before this, you were doing something else, right? So let's go pre-pandemic here. Now, I mean, maybe we got to go even further. So how'd you end up in Germany? Right? You kind of <laughs> well, mentioned I'm originally... it. Like, no, you're an American in Germany, and now you're living there. How'd you get there? You got it. It's a, it's a wild and crazy tale. Um, involves a lot of trains, planes, and automobiles. I'm originally from South Louisiana, Lafayette. And then I went to college in Atlanta, Georgia at Oglethorpe University, where I studied history and philosophy. I tried to get a real job, but the only place that was hiring with those degrees was Taco Bell. And um, (laughs) I wasn't really good at making the Mexican pizza. So I went back to New Orleans. I worked in a bar down in the French Quarter for a little bit. And I met this girl who was from London. I thought, I'm going to go to London with you. You're pretty. Got to London, met her boyfriend. Um, Wasn't very happy about that. And so hung out in London for a little bit, fell in love with the town, went back to New Orleans and... I was sitting in my little apartment outside New Orleans one night and thought, this isn't where I want to be. And so I called the one person who always was there for me and always could find solutions to my problems. I called my mom (laughs) and I was like, mom, I don't want to be here anymore. (laughs) Mom had a friend who was working for the American military. And she said, I could probably help your son get a job in a little town called Garmisch Partenkirchen, Germany, which is where there's an American military base. It's a recreation facility for soldiers where they come to learn how to ski, snowboard, kayak, go see Neuschwanstein Castle, the, of course, very famous uh, Disney's inspiration for Sleeping Beauty Castle. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I filled out the paperwork. She gave me a nice little recommendation and they flew me over to Germany. I worked for the American military for about a year and then packed my bags and started traveling. I was in Austria, Italy, Switzerland, Holland, but I always kept coming back to Garmisch. It was 
it just kind of drew me. It just, I always, I could always get a job. I could get my English fix. You know, if you need it, you know, you always want to be around some expats every now and then to talk about football and, you know, reminisce about how great hot dogs were. And <laughs> yeah, so I kept coming back and that's about 17 years ago. I finally just decided this was home. And then I met a local girl from here and we now have two daughters. And uh, so she's put that anklet on me. I'm not going anywhere. And you know, I've been ingrained into the Bavarian lifestyle. In fact, we don't live in Garmisch proper. We live in a little village about two, about, about 15 minutes outside of town. We have a population of about 5,000 people and 7,000 cows. It's called Old Stadt. Old Stadt. And yes, there are still people walking around here in their lederhosen every day going out to take care of their cows. It's really a lot of fun. So yeah, that's how I got here. Now, tour guiding. I was a tour guide working for some bigger companies mm-hmm. in and around Europe. That's how I kind of paid my way to travel, that and bartending. And so when I met my wife at that time, I was racing mountain bikes and working a part-time job and drinking the rest of the time. And so (laughs) I realized quickly if I was going to keep this amazing catch of a woman, um, I was going to have to do something to make some money. And I knew I was a pretty good tour guide. So I opened a business called All Things Garmish Tours. And that was 12 years ago. And we were very blessed, very successful. I opened it right as TripAdvisor became a thing. And my first client um, wrote a review on TripAdvisor, knowing what the platform was. And so I was the first tour guide to be reviewed in Bavaria for English speaking tourism. And so there's your SEO right there, search and optimization. <laughs> Boom, I shot through the roof. I, oh my gosh, it was right out the gate. So within three years, I'd opened a second business called Bavarian Beer Vacations and I had a staff of eight people. Mm-hmm. So we were, we were doing tours seven days a week, pretty much. It was a lot of fun. And then? everything yeah yeah let's let's, let's back up let's back up to new orleans though first did you (laughs) tour guide did you're a tour guide in new orleans because that is a fun place to do tours like whether it's the cemeteries or ghost tours or anything it's just a fun place oh i love new orleans with my heart and my soul and no i was never a tour guide in new orleans brian but i just it was it was some of the best time in my life and in fact when my daughters and everybody told me even people from New Orleans, like, are you serious? You're going to do this? Um, when my daughters were respectively nine and five, I took them to Mardi Gras. <laughs> <laughs> and we were right down in the French Quarter, baby, right in the French Quarter and stayed at the old Chandelier, uh, which is one of the best hotels in the world. <laughs> and uh, we were hanging out there with the owner, uh, the manager, who's also from Garmisch Park and Kirken. And so we just had a blast and we're eating amazing food at the the restaurant that's in there which is uh, i always forget the name of it it's uh, french for rabbit la patin la patin or whatever uh, amazing food old chandelier that's where you stay if you want to go to new orleans guys that's the hotel and it's right uh, right across from the french quarter in the warehouse district on chapatula just a really neat place and the kids had a blast and it is still you know it pulls at the heartstrings every time i think about it i love that town yeah, I, I love I love New Orleans too. I I grew up in Memphis, so right right up the river. <laughs> so, oh, exactly. <laughs> okay, I have a question. As a mom of a son, your mom was fine with you just going across the country and moving and living there. Did you? Did she come? <laughs> like I don't know. <laughs> well, I think she was tired of me calling her every night. Seriously, Nicolette, That's and true. then borrowing That's money and coming point. back home to Lafayette <laughs> to do laundry and stealing her food. And so yeah, she's like, go away, just go away. No. <laughs> my mom always knew that I had a, I loved all things Europe when I was a small child. I was not small. I was 10 years old when she took me to Europe the first time. My mother was an attorney and she had a client that was in London. And so we went to Europe a couple of times and it just, I loved it. Every single time I went there, I would just, I just got giddy to be so close to so much history, to be able to touch a church built, you know, in the 14th century, it, mm-hmm. that tactile, that ability. And then to hear the stories from people that actually were here and lived it. And I mean, it just, it was, it always drew me. And so she knew that if she could get me over here, I'd probably, in her eyes, you know, would stop doing laundry all the time at her place. <laughs> all right. That's the secret. Then. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> all right. So, Brian, are you done with your Louisiana questions? No, oh, well, I have a ton, but I'm, I'm waiting. You're good for Louisiana. Your flow, Nicolette. Oh, totally. <laughs> okay. well, I, I'm, I'm waiting curious. for the food part. I'm waiting for the food part. Yeah, well, <laughs> because, I mean, look, a lot of businesses took a hit, right? I mean, I'm sure you're not the only one, right? Now, but you use that and you 
you know, you creatively pivoted, which I mean, I don't think a lot of people were either fortunate enough to do or had the will to do. I mean, and, and I think that's a really, a really cool thing. So what, you know, was there a panic, right? Was there a bit of a panic? Oh my God. <laughs> oh, it was a nightmare. I was living on easy street, man. We had just bought a new Mercedes V class van for the business. You know, my wife and I, we just, as I told you earlier, before we started the podcast, had bought a home. And so I was living, things were, I was living the high life. And so we went to South Africa to do wine tours. We were visiting with some friends. We we're having a wedding there. And that was March of last year. When we got back, March 6th, I believe was the date. By March 17th, I had lost 120,000 euros in confirmed bookings and had to pay back 17,000 euros in deposits. Between the 6th and the 17th of March, gone. It was, And then by... By April 1st, the writing was on the wall. So I pulled my staff together and I said, guys, it's over. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spent a lot of time in my, uh, in my dirty underwear, uh, kind of moping around. Um, I had a full beard. Um, I didn't brush my teeth. <laughs> a lot of strange things happening, you know, in the nose area that I didn't care about. I was like, who cares? And uh, I was in bad shape. It was really rough. My, my wife basically you know took me outside and hit me with the the water hose kind of clean me up and so she told me to go get drink some beers with some friends but i mean it was covid time so you couldn't even get together with your friends yeah, right so secretly you know secretly we kind of bonded banded together put our masks on and we were drinking our beers with our masks <laughs> one of the one of the guys that was at the table he owned a restaurant in garmish he was a dear friend of mine his name is philip and i said uh philip how's it going and he was telling me his sob story about how he had let his chefs go and let his entire staff go and it something triggered in me I don't know what it was I started thinking about it you know and at that time that I'd been I had been approached by Airbnb and by um, Viatar and tours by local a lot of these larger travel platforms that I had worked with in the past because they were trying to pivot into virtual tourism mm -hmm. and I thought man it's not going to work a virtual tour it's like a YouTube video why don't why are you going to pay for something you can get on YouTube right but when I heard Philip say that he was letting go of his shafts, and I thought, man, there's so many shafts that are unemployed right now. And this is around the world. What about like a virtual cooking tour? Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking, you know, a couple of beers deep. I'm thinking, well, there's got to be a hook. There's got to be something that kind of makes it, you know, you can bring that connectivity together. And so I thought, well, with Zoom or these modern day video conferencing platforms, you can put more than one people on a screen. So let's bring families together from around the world. So like, you know, a soldier stationed in Ramstein, uh, Air Force Base can talk to his mom who's in Tennessee mm -hmm. uh, with a chef and learn how to make brownies together, you know, or get the grandkids out and let them talk to grandma on, on the screen and learn how to make bread or learn how to make a, a souffle or whatever. Maybe not a souffle, but you know, bread, <laughs> let's go with that. And uh, so that was my first hook. And then when I started kind of putting it all together in my mind, I thought, well, wait a minute. You know, right now in the United States, there's a lot of platforms trying to do grocery delivery. Uh -huh. It is becoming the big thing with COVID because nobody wants to go to the store. Nobody right. wants to, you know, see that stuff coming out of my nose. So <laughs> I started thinking, hmm, maybe I can piggyback on some of the bigger companies and do grocery delivery, ingredient delivery with the course itself. So the first person I approached was a dear friend of mine, Anthony Bandelin, who was a full stack programmer uh, and worked for Expedia. Um, I'm sorry, he worked for booking.com as a, a lead programmer. And so I was like, hey, Anthony, is this even a possibility? And he was like, yeah, this sounds fun. I want to do it. I'm like, yeah. And then I went, uh, spoke to another friend of mine, Jonathan Graver, who is the head chef overseeing six different restaurants here in the Alps. And I asked him, I was like, Jonathan, do you think this is something that could work? And if you do, do you maybe have somebody you'd recommend that I can bring on board to kind of take care of the chef aspect? He's like, yeah, me, 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 me. And there you go. Those are the three founders. And we all at one time were expats. We're living in Germany. And we all at one time worked for this American military base. And that's the birth of Deary Dari. We basically decided we were going to create a platform where chefs get on board for free, come on board, put up their own content, recipes, photos, uh, uh, kitchen skills, et cetera sell that content in the form of live video conferencing, connecting families because we purchased it by household. We have our own video conferencing embedded in our platform. So you don't have to use any of those other ones. And we have ingredient delivery if you live in the United States. 
So there you go. That's Dory Dory in a nutshell. <laughs> and you turned that around in months. We had it. We had the business <laughs> registered by June, and we did our beta test by December. Yeah. Wow. So we did That's our beta impressive. test. Before <laughs> That's yeah. impressive. That's the most it was, impressive it's, part to me. <laughs> It, it, it's been a wild ride getting the logistics too of not just putting the people together and the correct people but the delivery of the groceries on mm -hmm. top of that you know that that yeah. is impressive that was just pure luck you know brian what ended up happening there is we started thinking about how we're going to piggyback the logistics mm -hmm. are we going to build in um, an api how we're going to do this and we wanted to so source locally, you know, get the mom and pop grocery store involved so that whenever little Jimmy delivers the groceries to you, Nicolette will be like, oh, was this from, you know, Tom's Corner Store? And little Jimmy be like, yeah, Nicolette, here you go. You yeah. know, that right there, that interaction, we wanted that. We wanted that purity, mm -hmm. that, that um, what's the word I'm looking for here? That, that sustainability, but not, that's not the word, but that that knowledge of trust, you know, that trust right. that you know that Jimmy brought you good groceries and, you mm -hmm. know, the corner store around there is going to make sure they give you the fresh avocado, not the one that's brown, et cetera, et cetera. So we started looking for somebody that could help us out in this process. And I went back to a pool of amazing people that I've known over the years that have worked in Garmisch Park and Kirken mm -hmm. for the American military. And Laura Stutchley, who used to work with me in one of the old hotels in the dining room of a particular restaurant, I called her up and said, Hey, what do you think about coming on and doing this logistics for us? And she has made it something really, really special. Uh, just it's seamless. Basically, when you go to purchase an experience, you want to learn how to make, let's say, a deconstructed chicken pot pie with Chef Joshua Northcutt. Great chef. Highly recommend him. Okay. You get uh, your purchase page. The next thing we do is we ask for your zip code. You give us your zip code. Laura has manually gone in and put in every zip code that we can deliver to into our platform. You put in your zip code, boom, if it's in our deliverable range, you then have a list of ingredients that you can choose from. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people don't need, of course, the butter. They've already got butter in the fridge, right. so just delete that. Well, but I do need the corn. Okay, let's keep that. I do need the carrots, let me keep that. And then that's it. After that, you go to our third-party platform for payment, and that's where we capture your address, and Laura goes to work finding that corner store so that Jimmy can bring all those ingredients to you. What, what's, what's amazing about that too, is you're looking at also promoting other small businesses and, and giving them business and, and sort of, you know, passing on, you know, play, paying it forward, you know, where they're able to go and now, you know, make some money by delivering groceries, which is, which is great. We're trying, you know, that was the big thing. We didn't want to use some of the bigger companies out there and I'm not going to name the big one that right, everybody right. knows, <laughs> you know, but uh, sometimes we have to, depending on where you live. If you're like in, like my mother who wants to be the Unabomber and lives in a small village in the middle of Nash, outside of Nashville, Tennessee, where there's, you know, three people and uh, <laughs> 70,000 deer. So yeah. that's kind of a challenge. It's that way, Nicola. When you head south of that Nashville, it pretty much gets that way. Yeah, there's three, a lot of deer. Three people. There's a lot of deer. A lot there's of towns shotguns. named after deer. A lot of shotguns, a lot of deer. Yeah, yeah I think yeah, yeah. it's very true. Oh it's, oh, it's interesting. It's very interesting. But yeah, so we have to go to the big boys sometime for that. But every, uh, every time that we can, we try and get Jimmy out there on the streets working, not selling that crack cocaine, but delivering those groceries, you know? That's right. There you go. That is the goal. <laughs> legit, legit living, legit living. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, gosh. Okay, so I, I now back to the New Orleans questions, right? You, yeah. You come from a place where there's a lot of tourism and there's a lot of food and there's a lot of just that environment, right? Do you think that also in, impacted like putting all these things together a little bit? You know, the thought process? Well, definitely. The definitely. Now putting it all together, it honestly, I, I, I was being facetious earlier, but my mother has been a huge inspiration to me. She, mm -hmm. She's the one who forced me to stay in school to get an education. And she kept banging me over the head with this baseball bat that had written on it, keep your options open, you know, just right. hitting me constantly with it. Uh, you know, I guess it's stuck. And then where I'm from, the South, Louisiana, Lafayette, New Iberia, where Tabasco is made, which is literally yep. right down the street from my house, my mother's house, my father's house, my father's house. My mother moved to Tennessee, as I already mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, but in the New Orleans, living in New Orleans and going to New Orleans all the time. It, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. That, that culture is so amazing, so vibrant. 
And I think as well, Brian, it's a reason why I stayed here in Bavaria. Mm -hmm. You see the Bavarians, they have a strong culture. The Lederhosen, mm -hmm. the Dirndl, all that stuff with the leather pants right. and the crazy dancing. That's not Germany. That's, that's here. That's Southern mm -hmm. Germany. That's Bavaria, the farming area. And these people, they're very proud of who they are. And just like the Cajuns, you know, just like yep. the Creoles and the Cajuns and just like people from New Orleans, just New mm -hmm. Orleans, its own little circle of just pride, you know, ever since Katrina, those people have bound, binded together. And yeah, and so I, I see a lot of similarity between the two. Mm -hmm. And plus, yeah, the, even, even, histor even historically, right, there's a lot of history in New Orleans, you know, that oh, I, I would think helps spurt on your love of history, too, you know, for your oh, of course. Yeah, of course. I just wish Napoleon made it there. But uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, there's a, well, there's a lot history. of, look, there's a lot of European cult. I mean, you know, people even in America don't really understand. It's very, it's very French culture in, in like New Orleans and parts of the South versus the rest of the United States is really not, it's very English based, you know, even the way mm -hmm. things are done. So. No, oh, exactly. That Louisiana purchase is what changed it all. But you know, it's the, the, the real binding thing between that I see with the Cajuns uh, and I see with the Bavarians is both of them have a serious love of family and beer. And uh, so <laughs> those two things, man, it's great because here they have beer for breakfast, just like a Cajun. I'll have a Coors Light when they go out on a shrimp boat. Here they have a beer and they're in the fields, you know, and it's an Augustiner and they have their big mug, you know, and they're drinking a beer in the field, the, the, the fields as they're taking care of the cows. And so and they have a strong sense of family. So that's really something that I've seen over the years. <laughs> well, the Bavarians like to think they created like, beer, you know? Right. <laughs> Nicolette's like, what did I get myself into with these two Southerners here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. But, you know, I, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the chefs because I, I think oh, that's yeah. really cool. You know, uh, that's a really cool thing, um, in my opinion the different like how you're getting different styles right and so what types of chefs do we have going on here well this is where it got fun when i brought jonathan on board and i said jonathan you'll be in charge of all things chef and he's like well where am i going to find these chefs and i was like dude if you build it they will come if you build it they will come and uh, you have to understand i was watching many years ago this is also part of the inspiration for dairy Dari. is i was watching a tv show called chef's table i believe it's on netflix Mm -hmm. And they had this very, very, very famous chef. And I can't remember his name right now. He has a, a restaurant called The Farmhouse, I believe. And he's kind of the guy who pioneered this idea of uh, farm to table cooking. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about how hard it is to have a family because you're always working when the kids are, when you're putting the kids to bed or when the kids are out of school, you're working. Mm -hmm. So he never got to see his kids. And so when I told Johnny to go look for chefs, he's like, I don't think we're going to find you. I was like, yeah, we'll find them. They, they, will, they will come flocking to us. And it's not because of COVID, it's because a lot of chefs don't want to be in the industrial kitchen and have a family. They, they miss being able to play catch with their kid at night, you know, or a mom being able to tuck her, her daughter into bed. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we just put in a couple of ads on social media and then boom, it was like hotcakes. People just started coming at us. We created a, a way to onboard them so that we can kind of get some of the basic questions out, make sure they have certifications, et cetera. And then Jonathan and... Uh, also Chef Joshua Northcutt, who I mentioned earlier, who's come on board to help us a little bit more than just cooking. They interview every single chef and they want to know why they're here. What are they going to bring to the table? And do they have that skill to, to grab an audience using, you know, video conferencing? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's in its own right is, is a challenge. Mm -hmm. And so we vet them as they say. And then once we got them on the platform, we do everything we can to help market their experiences. We don't tell them what to put up there. We just simply say, hey, go crazy. Put stuff up there and see if it sells. If it doesn't, you, you're learning real fast. You know, this right. is trial by fire. And then what we do is when they sell something, we just take a platform fee. We just take a 25% platform fee and they keep the rest. So it's, it's very similar to where I come from, my background of working with online travel agencies such as Viatar, Expedia, because that's kind of the same way that they run. Mm -hmm. And the chefs, it's, it's so much fun. I mean, Nicolette, it's a blast. I mean, Rebecca, Chef Rebecca, she's so good. And she, she makes amazing food. And always her two daughters would come running into the kitchen during the shows. And she's like, <laughs> go away, go away. Mama's working. <laughs> you know, and then we've got, you know, Sabine, who has got this really amazing 
mix of Creole. Oh, Brian, you would love it. I mean, just yeah. amazing food. Creole <laughs> mixed with this kind of Southern style. God, she's really good. She did these braised beef cheeks just a couple of nights ago for a client. I kind of snuck in and watched a little bit of it. Of it. And it was, oh, it was so good. So yeah, it's just amazing. And then the other fun part about it is we give the chef and the customer the freedom to create what they want. So we have a chat feature. So once you get to the platform, you see a chef like Sabine, Brian, where you know that she's got that Creole influence and you know she's got that skill, but you don't see a recipe that you want to cook. Just talk to her. You can right there, just chat up with, chat it up with her and be like, hey, I really want to learn how to make a pistolet. Mm -hmm. She's like, I can do that. Come on, we'll go make a pistolet together, you know, and stuff that bread with some nice crawfish etouffee. Oh, it's going to be so <laughs> I'm getting hungry. I'm getting hungry. I know, me too. Me too. <laughs> You're setting well, me up for and we're, lunch. We're meeting with, uh, we're meeting with Josh next week, correct? And we're making, That's we're actually right. making, okay, he wanted to make Brussels sprouts, but I was not down with that. So <laughs> I was like, come on. Brian was, but I wasn't okay. having it. So we, we switched over to broccoli because I'm not uh, big it's on the Brussels sprouts. <laughs> She's like, it's well, the big. <laughs> Yeah, Joshua is funny. His girlfriend is a vegetarian. And so most of the stuff that he's put on the platform, she's leaning over his shoulder going, what are you putting up there? What is that? Is that, is that a cheeseburger? You know, no, no, you're not cooking a cheeseburger in my kitchen. <laughs> and so it's a lot of vegetables. So I'm not sure he probably did something with broccoli that's going to hopefully taste but good. Yes, it, we're going to do some broccoli. Yes, he does some ingredients and that'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> after after this, the audience can then tune in and, and watch us live. Oh, mess it wonderful. Up because, uh, yeah, it's um, be, you're going to watch us spaz out cooking some stuff. Listen. <laughs> I can make chicken cutlets like it's nobody's business, all right? But that's it. That is the one thing I've got going for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. I think I may have an advantage on her. My dad was in the restaurant industry in Barnes. Right. <laughs> so, oh, nice. <laughs> so so I, I spent many hours being a bar back and and uh, you know bartending and all that fun oh, stuff. Yeah. Listen, I worked, oh, yeah. a, I worked in a restaurant for 10 years. I didn't cook nothing, though. I will tell you. I was not cooking. I was... Get this on. We're going to get this on. You know, you, you, may, you may have to come and be the judge to see whose is better. I'm just saying. Mm. <laughs> I might. I would love to do that. I would love to come and just kind of sneak in and watch some of that one. I mean, you're going to have a lot of fun. Joshua, he's very animated. He's a really excellent chef. And everything he makes, I was joking earlier, everything he makes is exquisite. And that deconstructed chicken pot pie, that's one of his dishes as well. So he's really, really good. His You'll have a blast. His girlfriend get mad about the chicken and the chicken Yeah, pot I was just thinking. <laughs> I think so. Ask him about it when you talk to him. <laughs> but she is a sweetheart. She's an amazing woman too. But yeah, definitely ask him about it when you have him on the show. <laughs> so, okay. So let's say, I mean, things will eventually return to normal. I don't know how the situation is there specifically at the moment but I mean eventually normalcy will return is your plan to I mean obviously you're going to keep going with with Dari Dari correct and then mm, will correct. you pivot back into into travel as well you know that's a question that a lot of people have asked me um honestly I don't think I will I think Dari Dari it's taken so much of my my heart that I, I have to I have to see it get to where I want it to go right now Dari Dari we're in the United States um where it's I love this it's just how do I say this the emotional connection we can bring to a family or to friends it, it's stealing my heart and as much as I love history and I love going to see castles and taking people to beer festivals and the Oktoberfest and that kind of stuff I can still do that and, you know, do it for fun. Or maybe, you know, a buddy of mine's got a great tour guide service. I'll go and work for him a couple of days a month just mm -hmm. to kind of get it out of my system. But I don't want to let these chefs down. And I don't want to deny people this ability to connect. Just, I mean, we had a show a couple, couple of nights ago where it was a 14-year-old daughter connecting to her mom who was on business away in Canada and she hadn't seen her mom in like three weeks and together they got to come together and they made a, like a butternut squash soup. And it was just neat because just to see the dynamic, you know, I, every now and then I'll just kind of, you know, tap in with the chef and see how the show's going. And uh, it was, it was really, it was a beautiful experience. And I, I really want to keep that going forward. Right. Now I being a tour guide, I love, but you know, <laughs> I think you should do tour guides once a week on Friday night and do a do a Jerry Dari where you're trading it for do a beer tour and free beer. <laughs> Dude, I love everything about beer. Oh gosh. 
Um, yeah, well, right now, the one thing I won't be able to completely get out of my system is the Oktoberfest. I love taking <laughs> people to the Oktoberfest and I keep the best tables at the Oktoberfest. I have a table at like Schützenfest Hall, uh, the Schützenfest at the Schottenheimel, which is the oldest tent of the Oktoberfest where the Schottenheimel, actually Albert Einstein used to change the light bulbs inside that tent. Wow. And then, you know, Augustiner, which is the oldest continuously ran brewery in the city of Munich. They opened their doors in 1328 old catholic brewery which was during the time of napoleon because of um oh uh, gosh what was it called um well but basically the when napoleon shows up here during the napoleonic wars he took away all the the industries of the church and um secularism that's what it was called and so the brewery was sold to the joseph wagner family and one of my favorite parts of the tale brian and you'll appreciate this is in 1972 because of tax purposes the Wagner family sold 49% of the brewery for $1 to an organization that gives money to children's charity in Bavaria. So basically now when you drink an Augustiner, you're give, you're doing God's work, literally doing God's work. You're giving money to children, yeah. to charity. I mean, this is the way to drink a beer, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, man, and then my beer. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, my favorite tent at the Oktoberfest, which if you guys ever get to go to the Oktoberfest and you can get a, get a seat there, go to the Kafer, K-A-E-F-E-R tent, the Kafer Fest. It is the best Oktoberfest tent. And you're always going to see somebody famous. Arnold Schwarzenegger sits two tables down from me every year. And it is just the best food, the best booze, everything you can imagine, plus that lively atmosphere. So it is, it's a, it's, I love the Oktoberfest. I love the history of it. Ludwig the first. I mean, it's just so much fun. So that I won't be able to get completely out of my system, Brian. So I will probably still be taking people to the Oktoberfest just because I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I have an idea. I think you should get those robots, you know, the robots and, and put people's well, faces like on them. Right, and then nail them to them with their ingredients so that their you know people are walking around their kitchen with them that's my idea mm -hmm. <laughs> a little robot yeah I yeah see which we're robot you're together. talking about oh, <laughs> yeah. your idea was going to be bring us to oktoberfest nick no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, sort of, I was like sort of disappointed man i love robots but sorry <laughs> <laughs> i was I being all practical and business-minded <laughs> Yeah. children it's totally different yeah. angle. <laughs> look for robots <laughs> Robot, look for resi there you go go with it run with it i'll see what i can find <laughs> oh, definitely goodness. well I, okay jake is there anything else that we should know about anything i've had so much fun i feel like we've been drinking this whole time so i don't know where i am now but uh, is there anything else <laughs> <laughs> this isn't coffee <laughs> <laughs> and nah <laughs> and please also let us know where um where we can get involved and where we can learn oh, more well, about thank your you garden. guys well the first thing i got to tell you guys about and i really appreciate you giving me this platform to do it is our kids cook camp i have two daughters and i have a right now she's 12 and well actually no gosh i don't even know the age of my children wow this really <laughs> isn't coffee is it but um i've got a <laughs> I've got a 10 year old and a six year old and it's kind of daunting for my 10 year old to get up in the morning and start making pancakes for us when we're still in bed hungover, my mm -hmm. wife and I. So I decided let's get some sort of a kid's cook camp where she can get the training necessary so that, you know, she doesn't burn down the house um, or <laughs> as she does quite often feed us raw pancakes in the morning. It doesn't go well with a hangover. Don't do it. So, um, we in the middle. We, I just got, yeah, find, let's find a middle ground here. So we uh, basically started this whole program. It's going to start in June. It's going to go June, July, and August, where we're going to put four to six kids from around the world into a virtual kitchen with a chef. And they're going to work for about an hour a day for three days or five days, depending on the age of the child. And we go from the age of eight all the way to the age of 19. And we group them by age. So all the eight-year-olds are going to come together in a group of four or a group of six, and they're going to have a chef, and they're going to learn basic kitchen skills. And they're going to learn how to prep a meal. They're going to learn kitchen hacks. And we send every child a, a chef kit, which has got all the little things that they're going to need just to basically kind of prepare themselves for living in a kitchen, to working in a kitchen. Mm -hmm. And we give them, of course, a chef hat with Deary Dari written on the side. So we're really excited about that. And it's going to run June, July, and August. And we do, like I said, from eight all the way to 19. 
for between the ages of 17 and 19, it's a little more intense because we want these almost young adults mm -hmm. to be able to move out of their mom's house and not make them suffer like my poor mother did <laughs> and have you know them come back every day looking for chicken McNuggets and granola bars and whatever else that they can raid from their mother's fridge. And so we want to give them the skills so that they can go out and live on their own a full, a full life and a healthy life. I mean, we don't want to make in pizza run every night, you know, let's, let's, let's mix it up a little bit. Let's see if we can get you to create something like chef Joshua Northcutt, maybe some broccoli or something a little bit healthier, <laughs> but we also want to keep it fun. And so we're doing things as well, like how to make a ham and cheese sandwich using an iron or how to pimp your ramen oh, and that kind of really stuff. Cool. So, yeah. You know, got to get them ready for college, but at the same time, we're right. going to keep mom happy. <laughs> so we're going to do some granola and stuff like that. So we can get them prep for that test the next day. And, and once again, it's all about a building bonds with people that you know, may not have ever met. I mean, we've got kids signing up that their parents are in the military. And so there's a, a girl who just signed up from Japan, who's 12 years old. And we got a couple of kids in Germany signing up already. So you never know who's gonna be on the class with you, with you for three to five days and what kind of friendships you can make. Not including, of course, this amazing gift of kitchen skills. You now can get up in the morning and make pancakes for mom and dad and hopefully know how to make a mimosa too. So. <laughs> <laughs> you teach that too. No. That's on the list. It's on the list. <laughs> Remember, you can talk to the chef. You can find out how to make anything That's you right. want. To put mimosa exactly. On. It's, it's right there. Interactive. The chef is literally right there on the screen with you, walking you through every step, looking at what you're cooking to make sure you don't burn the house down. So yeah. Yeah. So we're super excited about that. So if you guys get a chance, anyone out there, just head on over to deridari.com, D-E-R-I-D-A-R-I.com. Scroll down and look at that big orange screen, big orange sign on our landing page, and it's gonna have a child with that chef hat. Click on it and you'll get all the information and details and sign your kid up. This is a great COVID safe way for your kids to have a camp this summer and still meet some kids and learn some really good skills. So yeah, we're super excited about it. That's awesome. I'm actually going to share that. I'm, I'm in a mom's group and they started this virtual class group, which is an offshoot of my, of my original mom's group. And my son won't stare at a computer. So he's a lost cause, but all these other kids are having a lot of fun. So I think I'll, uh, I'll uh, share this with them as well. So another option. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nicolette. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. We're, we got the chefs, we're working with the chefs to make sure that they're, you know, prepared and prepped. These are all chefs that work with kids anyway. Mm -hmm. But we want to make sure that that virtual kitchen is going to be filled with a lot of fun, a lot of laughter, and a lot of connections. So we're, we're even talking about maybe the kids sending pen pal letters and stuff like that, just so that they can kind of keep that connective, that idea of connection, but yet using this virtual platform that we have on Deary Dari to, to make it, you know, safe and fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much, Jake. This, this is a lot of fun and that sounds like a lot of fun. So I'm excited to see how things unfold and if you get the robots and, um, you know, let us know. And, uh, and <laughs> we will be with Josh next week cooking some broccoli or burning <laughs> some broccoli. And uh, we'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> definitely, definitely. I'm going to have to watch that episode and I'm going to send you a comment and say who did it best. But I don't want to be on the show because I'm afraid Perfect. you come after me. So, <laughs> from Perfect. a far away distance, safe distance, I will write a comment saying who the was robot best. will write it. It's fine. <laughs> the, robot. the robot. He'll send the robot with we'll his uh, judgment. His <laughs> you got it. <laughs> but I got to warn you, Nicolette, us Southern boys, we stick together. I just got to warn know, you in advance. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in everyone's defense, I can't cook. So, it's okay. I know. <laughs> the only person who loves my cooking is my son. So that's it. That's Aww. the only, he's the only one. <laughs> that's awesome though. That's perfect. <laughs> he doesn't know any better. So I, uh, <laughs> I, yeah. So on that note, um, we will put all those links into the description and, um, we are excited to see how this unfolds. So thank you so much, well, Jake. We you. really, we're, we really had a lot of fun. Oh man, this was a blast. Thank you both, Nicole, Nicolette, Brian. Thank you so much for letting me be here today on Insomnicat. I had so much fun talking with you guys. This was a, this is really a pleasure. So thank you so much. <laughs>